When we're looking at potential security vulnerabilities, I'm going to separate what we can control in our own security from what we can't control with other people in tech. First, we'll cover how to avoid phishing and email and password security. Then we'll move on to hardware wallets, two-factor authentication, and VPNs with some final thoughts. This will just be a basic overview to get you started. However, I recently did a full security overhaul video that you can check out after this video. While it's impossible to have 100% perfect security, the goal I'd recommend for most people is to make sure you're not the low-hanging fruit. Most malicious attackers are going to go for easy targets, and a few basic things can make you safe for most attacks. Now you've got to decide for yourself how you want to handle your security, because there is this trade-off between security and convenience. Just make sure you find that and you don't wait till you're hacked or lose access to your funds to figure all this out. The first topic I want to talk about is phishing, because even with the best intentions, you've still got to be vigilant. All it takes is a moment of weakness, and you're going to have to go into severe damage control. Phishing is where attackers will try to look official in order to bait you into giving up valuable information or access. This can be done over the internet or can be done over the phone, which is called vishing. Now, before we continue, pause this video, go to the hacking challenge video that's linked below and watch it. It's only six minutes long. It's, it's worth watching, I promise. Then come back here and we'll get to work. I'll wait. You watched it. Now that was an eye-opening video, right? So now we don't want to make sure that doesn't happen to you. So let's cover some basic rules and best practices to avoid phishing attempts. First, take your time. And if you're unsure about a link or attachment, don't click it, especially if it's crypto related. Ignore pop-ups. They're completely obnoxious anyway. Bookmark sites that you use often to avoid a typo sending you to the wrong website. Watch for grammatical errors or unexpected greetings and urgent requests. Don't ever download attachments from unknown sources. Don't provide sensitive information over email. Be especially careful about shortened URLs as they are an easy way for an attacker to obfuscate the malicious website. Now, if you use Telegram or another messaging app, go to your privacy settings and go to your group settings and make it so people can't add you to groups. And then also, please make sure that you have a password enabled for Telegram or other messaging services. The next thing to understand when it comes to digital security is that your primary email address is everything. It's the core of your digital identity. Once it's compromised, exchange accounts and bank accounts can be emptied within an hour. Social media accounts, cloud storage accounts, your Apple account or Amazon account are all accessible once your email's compromised. Then they can potentially drain your exchange accounts and wire money out of your bank account. If they know your approximate time zone, they can do this at night when you're not going to be getting all these confirmation emails. Now there's an old article linked below of this exact thing happening and it only took an hour to destroy this guy's digital identity. Now, I mentioned phishing before primary email address because if you set up your email at a phishing site, everything's already lost. Keeping your main email address secure is the most important of all. Now, if you're still not convinced that you should get a fresh email address, go to haveibeenpwned.com from the link below, which you can also see on screen, and see if your email address and other info has been leaked online already. If you've had your email address for more than a year or two, there's a high chance that you've been pwned already and you should change it. You can also check your phone number there. At the bare minimum, you should have one email address that is used only for crypto, specifically only for crypto exchanges. This email should not have your name or any other personally identifiable information in it so that even if it's leaked, it won't be easily traced back to you. Once you have your email set up, the next thing to do is to get a password manager. If you're not sold on the idea, watch the video down below with Edward Snowden on Last Week Tonight. He also shares a good strategy on making a passphrase if you still don't want to use a password manager. Although, I don't know why you want to use it. They're so convenient, just auto-filling passwords. They're great. Just get one. Now, there are some cases when hardware wallets and two-factor authentication are absolutely essential. This includes your crypto wallets and any bank or exchange accounts, and preferably your email account too. As was covered in the earlier courses, a hardware wallet is an absolute must if you have more than, I'd say, 10 times as much crypto as the cost of the hardware wallet. But you can do this, you can decide for yourself. So I think if you have $1,200 in crypto and the Ledger Nano X is $120, I'd pick one up. A hardware wallet is a device that generates your recovery phrase and private keys completely offline and they never leave the device. So they're never shown on anything that's connected to the internet. Hardware wallets do connect either wirelessly or corded to your computer or mobile device, but they don't connect to the internet directly. This makes them cold wallets. 
And then hot wallets are wallets that are apps on your phone, software on your computer, extensions in your browser, or hosted on a website. So think of hot wallets as the wallet you'd carry with you in your pocket and a hardware wallets as a safe at home. So it's best to only leave as much in them as you'd be comfortable carrying as cash in your pocket. Hot wallets show your recovery phrase on screen, which immediately means they're unsecure, which is why hardware wallets show your wallet address only on the device itself. Your recovery phrase always gives complete access to your funds, so we really only want that to be shown on a device like a Ledger, Trezor, Cold Card, or other hardware wallet, and never on any device that is connected to the internet. And we'll cover how to set up your Ledger wallet to MetaMask later in the course so you can use it and still access Web3 applications and maintain your security. Now, if you've got other questions or comments on hardware wallets, there are links below and we'll have a forum discussion dedicated to it. Now, let's talk about two-factor authentication. While SMS two-factor authentication is better than nothing, it makes it vulnerable to a SIM swap attacks, as you saw in the hacking video earlier, where she got his email address, added herself to his phone plan, and change his password all within a couple minutes. Now for our authenticator apps, good choices here are Google Authenticator, LastPass Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, Authy, and Duo Security. These are more secure than SMS verification, less secure than hardware verification, but they are compatible with more services than hardware verification. But the last one are hardware-based authentication, and they're a lot more convenient to use than something like a ledger because you don't have to use it every time you log in. You mainly only have to use it when you do a hard logout or when you set up a new device. Now, I use the Google Titan here, which you can see if it's going to, there we go. The Google Titan, which is a little device. It's got NFC, USB-C on it. You can also use the UB keys. Those are also really good if you don't want to use something that's Google. And it's really good for your computer or mobile device because it's got USB Type-C and NFC in it. Now, the last part I want to discuss are VPNs. There's a lot of misinformation on VPNs, especially on YouTube videos that are sponsored by VPNs, and they're not the ultimate solution that they are often claimed to be, but they are useful. Now, I started using VPNs regularly when I lived in China to bypass the Great Firewall, so censorship or bypassing censorship is a really good use case. VPNs can also be great to access geo-locked content. So if Netflix or another streaming service is blocked in your country, a VPN can help you get around it. As far as VPNs go, I've tried several of them myself. I've done research on other ones, and I've come up with three that I can recommend the most highly. These are Proton VPN, Molvad VPN, and Private Internet Access. All three of them are open source. They can be used anonymously, and you can pay with crypto. Now go deeper into why I chose that three in the security overhaul video that's linked below. Now, even with all of this set up, the biggest risk is yourself. And we call that procedural risk. Knowing what you're doing, being smart about your transactions, managing risk, all of the actions you take when you're interacting in DeFi leave the potential for mistakes, which can be costly. Now, the best way to avoid procedural risk is to be mindful of what you're doing, avoid complacency, and use test nets for practice, which is why that's what our first tutorials are going to be about. Now, your task for this lesson is to watch that security overhaul video that goes into more depth and put all of this information into action, or at least as much as you're comfortable doing. We've also opened a forum discussion for this lesson, so if you have any questions or opinions about any of this you'd like to share, jump in there and let's talk. Then in our next lesson, we're going to go into security and risks that you can't control, which is other people and tech.